So you got to the start of the convention. How were you feeling on the first day? Can well, you remember? I, I got past that particular crisis. And then the crises were a rather more minor. Um, we uh, The committee had a suite on the top floor. And uh, at some stage, someone, not me, had authorised a... Um, uh, computer games were very uh, new then. Wang. Wang, uh, Wang computers had a, oh, yes. a a sort of a gadget a gadget for uh, for uh, arcades, and they produced three of them, and three exotically dressed ladies to uh, show people how to do it, and the only place we had to put them was in our suite, which meant that. Uh, I, who was supposed to be sleeping there, couldn't because the machines were absolutely jammed with people stay playing whatever it was. It was a, a Star Trek game. It was, it, it was a shoot down the flying saucers sort of thing, I think. Never saw it. Anyway, it was a very early computer game of the kind uh, that financed arcades across the world for years. But it was new and popular and uh, a great distraction, as were the ladies. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> two lists on the two schedules. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, those were the days when the speeches and the awards were given at the banquet. And the banquet tickets were considered very expensive, $8, I think. Um, I forget what it cost for membership, but eight dollars seemed expensive to a lot of people. I know Bruce Pell's kept all his receipts from every convention. <laughs> he showed me one at one time years later. Um, and he showed so, me that. So, did you have uh, that was pricey? Did you have trouble um, with the Hugo well, Awards? Are, the, are there Hugo any? Are there any? Attend. Are you? Are there any stories that you can actually tell us about that? Because I know we've all got stories about the Hugo Awards for our um, uh, our world cons. Well, the Hugos, as now, the actual voting and counting was done by a separate person who was later stupid enough to become a co-world chair, let's say. Oh, David Green. Not David Green was the one, yes. yeah. And... Um, and uh, and one of the uh, one of the conventions I attended in the states before um, Worldcon, uh, I was approached by a very large man who I later realised was Jerry Pornell, who uh, I should mention had a hearing impediment. Um, and as a result, tended to bellow. And in a room at uh, an, uh, a last first meeting, he bell uh, surrounded by last first people. He bellowed in my ear, "Robin, I'm I'm not going to be able to come to Ozicon unless I know I've won." Uh, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, it would have been nice to see you. <laughs> and uh, when I explained what that meant, which was that if I had any influence, I wouldn't. But I didn't have any influence because it was run by something else. He just assumed I was kidding. Mm. And subsequently got his publisher to send... I think it was 10 copies mm. of the hardback, which was not small, by airmail to uh, the uh, committee's post office box. I should point was, out here that I, the book we're talking the book we're talking about, I think, is The Moat in God's Eye, which he wrote with Larry Niven. And it was um, on the best novel ballad up against the eventual winner, uh, The Dispossessed by the guest yes. of honor, Le Guin. Um, I so was the only person who had the key 
to the post office box because I passed it every way, every day to and from work. But it happened to arrive during a period I was out of town. And the person who was on duty at the, the mail centre uh, didn't know that, um, you know, the, uh, there were several of us and uh, uh, that it would be picked up and sent it back because it wasn't cleared within two days or something. And in those days, I don't know, maybe it still does, there was airmail. So it had come airmail. It probably weighed five kilos um, and was not cheap. And it was sent back at the uh, at the uh, original sender's expense. So shortly after that, I got a panic phone call from Fred Patton, who was our agent in Los Angeles, to say... Um, Jerry Pornell has been in my ear, and of course I knew what that meant, to say that the publishers were pretty unhappy um, that we hadn't accepted it. And uh, Fred, of course, would have known that uh, there was no point sending us the books, or we could, uh, you know, even if we had got them in time, uh, he wouldn't have influenced the, the voting. But um, I imagine he, he was not on uh, Cornell's uh, good books, as was I not, uh, for some time to come. Um, were, there any, were there any other major oh, semi-catastrophes, shall we say, uh, that occurred yeah. during um, Ozicon that you can tell us about? You know, I can't think of any real catastrophes, uh, there were things that we didn't get organised as well as they might have done. Um, for example, in the, uh, in the masquerade, people in costume, the only way they could get to, to backstage was through the kitchen. And uh, it was fairly close quarters. I don't know whether there were any culinary disasters as a result, but uh, <laughs> there were some fairly bulky costumes. Um, not real catastrophes. One of the things that was, I think, new at the convention was that, uh, I'm having trouble remembering the name of the person, but one of the uh, early fans had gone into a um, business of making presentations at conventions. Barry Salgram. Barry Salgram was his name. And the company had a system of uh, projecting slides on the screen with a sort of um, linked remote control connected to a soundtrack. And so we set it up that every session of the main, in the main room, and there were only sort of two or three separate things going on at any one time. There were, was led into by a progression of, a, you know, slides from a carousel, because mm -hmm. in those days, people had slides, they didn't have digital stuff. And this was um, tied up with a music track. It was, um, this was a novelty. Hmm. And uh, we had a few panics about that because the selection had to be, you know, the order of physical strides on the uh, the round uh, carousel had to be set up with a soundtrack. And there were a few things that went wrong there, but no, I don't think anyone really worried about it very much. No. The worry was afterwards because one of the post-con events was a day trip by train up to Ballarat, where I'm actually living at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, um, for some reason, uh, Mike Glickson, who had uh, lent us um, quite a few slides that were used in the thing, I had arranged to give him back the slides on the train ride. 
and somehow in between the carousel had got lost. The entire carousel, it, it wasn't only Mike's slides, it was several other people's, quite a lot of mine actually. Um, which is one of the reasons why I don't have many uh, pictures from before the convention related to fandom. And um, I, I, relations were soured between me and Mike as a result. Uh, so how did you feel about how Ozicon went? Did you think that it was um, a success? I, I I thought it it was a success. I I, I got some feedback, uh, but over a long period of time, that lots of other things, sort of, including people getting interested in fandom generally, people deciding to go into writing. The writers' workshop was a brilliant success. Mm -hmm. um, a book came out about that. I think Lee had Lee, Lee Harding, yeah. Lee Harding, Lee Harding yeah. Yeah. Um, a book of some of the stories that were submitted during the uh, the workshop. Uh, so it started a whole lot of stuff. I personally went into something close to catatonia. Uh, mm, I know how that feels, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do seem to remember there being a panic about cash. Mm. Uh of, um, it wasn't a, a uh, I don't think it was a holiday weekend the convention, it was just a, a random weekend in mm. August mm. Um, and uh, so it can't have been that that meant the banks were closed except the weekend part of course but um, cash was a problem and at one stage one of the American visitors who uh, didn't come with the group, had borrowed some money off me personally because um, he couldn't change his American dollars. Um, and uh, I, as a result, I was short of cash and he didn't pay me back until I went and hammered on his door in Boston some years later. Oh, dear. Um, um, makes that, it a bit hard. Mm. Yeah, he, he wasn't, uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention his name, partly because I'm not 100% sure I've got it right, but uh, it festered with me for a bit. But as I had relatives in Boston and uh, um, went there from time to time, you know, I had the opportunity. So what... That day he lived on Beacon, uh, Beacon Hill. So what did you do after Ozicon, after that was finished? As little as possible, I think. I'm trying to think. What, uh, it's a while we, ago, so you must have done something since then. <laughs> I could probably look up. Um, well, well travelling. But, but you, did, I, you, did, I, did you go travelling? Well, I didn't go to any World Cons for a bit. Mm. Uh, the 76th World Con was Kansas City, no. <laughs> 77, no, I think the next one I went to was 79 in Britain. Mm. Uh, and um, and by that stage, they were already talking, Australian fandom was already talking about a repeat of the well, uh, Ozicon experience. For 80, planning to bid for 83, I think it was. Yeah, in Sydney, yes. Yeah. And uh, that, so, uh, that had competition. I, I I don't remember the story. Lee would have to. This is not the era that Lee's working on. At no, the no, so, no, no. But were, were you involved in the, the Sydney and eighty three bid? Hardly, hardly at all. You were in Sydney by this date. I I'm trying to remember when I moved to Sydney. Uh, yes, I I think I moved to Sydney about seventy nine or eighty. But I wasn't, I, I was involved with some local Sydney conventions. Um, I, uh, I haven't thought about my own history too much yet. Well, I remember, uh, I remember meeting you in, um, I think, the 84 uh, Sydney convention. 
Um, I was living in Canberra at the time and drove up. Uh, that was the one that Harlan Ellison was the guest of honour at. But were you involved in helping organise any of the city conventions after AussieCon and before well, I, I, I often 85? was involved with the travel for guests of honour if, yep. if they were from overseas. But um, uh, I don't think I was particularly involved. Um, the only, you know, not, not in Sydney... Uh, I'm trying to remember what what, um, what actually caused the Sydney eighty three bid to fold. Uh, I think. Well, I, I think, think well they they, they lost out. Really. They lost out to Baltimore, and they just uh, were up against a very strong American um, yeah. Worldcom bid. I think. I, I believe. Don't hold me to this, but I believe that they had the highest um, losing vote or the highest overseas uh, losing vote uh, up until that point. Uh, so you weren't involved very much in uh, the conventions there, and we're leading up through to 1985. Were you? You still started travelling after 1979. Were you travelling overseas quite a lot? Yes, uh, but um, I, I'd have to uh, look at a cheat sheet on another page. But uh, I, I went to. Um, are there any are there any world cons that stand out for you at all? Uh, oh yes, uh, well I, I even went to a few regional conventions. I remember going to a windy con in Chicago. I remember going to uh, a copper con in uh, um, Phoenix. I remember going to one in Albuquerque. Bubonicon, Bubonicons were. Uh, one as a travel agent, I sent several people to uh, on the way because it's usually the weekend before World Con. Mm -hmm. um, I went to uh, a couple of conventions in Britain, uh, but I'd, I'd have to. Uh, um, well, what is it about what is it about attending conventions that you like so much? Well, it's meeting the people. I by this time I knew quite a few people. Um, even if only at conventions, uh, there are f the. Uh, I don't think there's anyone I'm still in contact with that I knew in Britain before I left in '68. But uh, one of the few was a fellow named Gary Hoff, who was then a German, who visited the Bristol Easter Con sometime in the '60s. And subsequent, uh, I, uh, he met me off the plane in Frankfurt when I arrived for the for Hikon in 1970, and drove me there. And uh, he subsequently moved to Australia, and live uh, still lives in Perth, um, but is not he occasionally goes to regional conventions, but um, I, I haven't seen him for some years now. Uh, how long? How long did you live in Sydney for? Uh, after you moved there in the late seventies. Oh um, well, I moved to Hobart in 1984 when I got married. Mm -hmm. That was mainly because my wife had a house there. <laughs> and, uh, but you're going back to where you were born, so that was interesting. Right, that's right. Yes. Well, actually, my wife's mother was an next door neighbour of my parents when they were living there. And during the war, would send food parcels. Oh. They sort of sailors died to bring food parcels from Tasmania to England. Um, some got through, of course. Mm. But, uh, it, it's um, so when when I first moved to Australia, I knew her parents. She was then married to someone else, but after he died, I, I married her. And okay. Moved to Tasmania. And uh, how long was it before you started getting back into helping to organise conventions down there again? I was talking yesterday to Kerry Lenahan, who had moved to Australia sometime. Uh, I'd have to check the date, and he, behind my back, organised. Um, without being there at a convention in Perth, where the NatCon was that year, 
for um, there to be a, a bid from Hobart um, for me to present, and I had about five minutes' notice. <laughs> uh, so I was suckered into it, basically, by Kerry, and I shall hold him responsible. But we, we decided that uh, there was a rather limited number of places in this country holding conventions. Mm. Sydney had sort of dropped out. Uh, I'm trying to remember which year uh, Falcon was, 19. No, it didn't go. Uh, no, mid, mid-90s, mid 95, was it? 94? Somewhere around there, yeah. Um, and uh, there, there was um, a... Uh, a rather nice old centre city hotel that had a convention space that would hold the sort of numbers we might have expected, you know, not far above 100. Mm. And uh, we got Kim Stanley Robinson as guest of honour. That might have been the second one. Uh, I, I, I think, it, uh, goodness, I, I should be better at remembering who was where when. But... Um, there were two uh, thylacons, um and uh, George, George Martin, the other. George Martin was, was, was the uh, was the first one, yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson it was, I think, at least the second of the Mars trilogy had come out, and uh, at the time we had. Uh, a senator from Tasmania who was in fact American, uh, 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 who was a Democrat, which is not one of the major parties in Australia. And um, we got him to uh, uh, be principal in a debate about, well, basically red Mars versus blue Mars. And uh, the author of the other... So it was, uh, I've always thought that a debate would be a good thing to hold at a convention. And I thought it was good, but uh, I don't know that it's been done since. Michael Thylacon. Thylacon, one of the um, now extinct Tasmanian uh, animals was the thylacine, which was... Uh, in the ecological niche that the wolf is in the rest of the world, I guess, it it had stripes, but looked rather like a wolf or a dingo. And um, my wife is just old enough to remember seeing the last one alive. Uh, I'm not. So the last one died uh, in 1937, I believe. Yeah. There is a movie of it, uh, and one of one of the fans in Hobart was involved in a um, an attempt to clone, well, to sort of fake, re-establish the fallacy. I don't know whether anything ever came of it, but he managed to uh, uh, get some publicity for it around that time. And so we used th Thalacon as the name because it was sort of in the news in Tasmania at the time. Did you enjoy running the, those those couple of conventions? Well, that was a lot more sociable because they're a lot smaller. I mm. mean, a convention of 100 or 150 people, um, you know, you can talk to everyone. Did you, uh, do, did, did you aim to do much uh, organising after that or did it just... <laughs> So did you decide I, that was I, enough? I don't think I'm much of an organiser, really. I'm a delegator. Kerry Ke Lenahan did most of the work, Michael Bryan. Um, and uh, there is a uh, fandom in Tasmania still exists, but Keith Curtis hadn't moved there then. He's, he's a long-standing collector and occasionally can be persuaded to do some work. Um in an organising way. Uh, there is a picture of him uh, and Lenahan in the... Uh, and Mike, yeah. in, and, and Mike O'Brien in the pictures. Um, 
the Tasmanian fandom is fairly small still. Uh, yes, tra traveling, I, I, there was a period in which I went to practically every World Cup. Um, and, you know, often I'd go to regional conventions if they sort of fitted in with the schedule. And several times I was I was traveling anyway and uh, fitted in a convention. Um, but I technically reached the airline retiring age about um, uh, 1990 something. And from then on, long distance travel became a lot cheaper. Not free, but cheap. So you've had a long experience of fandom, uh, all right from uh, even before you came to Australia, all the way right through to now. Uh, what do you think some of the best things are about fandom that you've come across? I won't ask you about the bad well, things because we could all talk about those, but what are the best things? You haven't you really mentioned fanzines. And I'm while I have published a new zine for a short period, I've, uh, I've not really run a, I've not really pub my ish. Um, the uh, but fanzines are, are the well for my generation anyway have always been the big connector, mm. and it meant that even if you weren't frequently in the letter call, running uh, a zine like yours, for example, is, is a brilliant way of getting to know people mm. in places you don't know. Mm. And uh, I, I was lucky in that some of the people I met early on uh, in in my trip on the way home after HICON in 1970, I stopped at several places in America to visit people I'd met at HICON. Uh, an example was, uh, uh, was Bruce in Los Angeles. Bruce is for elephant. So you... Get, getting all the way right through uh, your fanish career, you ended up as um, fan guest of honour at a certain convention in Melbourne, uh, AussieCon 4, 2010. I don't know whether and, you might have had anything to do with that. Uh, no, I just tagged along. I was just hanging around the edges. What? Um, uh, how was that experience? That, that was extraordinary. Um, first time I've ever been handed a packet of cash on arrival. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do like to bribe our guests to keep them yeah, quiet, uh, say good things about us. I didn't even know what a per diem was. <laughs> the the suite, uh, I, uh, Alicia and I stayed at a suite at the top of the hotel, which it turned out no one else could go unless they were also resident on the on the top floor, which is possibly less than a great idea. Um, but, you know. Her, Hotel exclusive floors for VIPs. What we uh, um, it had the most complicated coffee machine I've ever had. I was still only halfway through the handbook by the time we left. <laughs> Seventy two pages it was. Oh my god! It was also the. Uh, I'm thinking about the location of that of the Hilton. Mm. It's built in a place that had basically was expected to become live with the opening of the enormous con convention centre next door, but mm. didn't because of, I don't know, economic collapse of mm. you know, eight, I suppose. Yes, I think that was probably it, yeah. There weren't we, any places to eat around there. We had, you... we, we had been told that all of those places around there nearby would be open and kicking off by then, and it looked like they were going to be, but they just didn't make it in time. And then a year or so later, there they were. So we yeah. missed out by about a year. And I think you're right. I think it was the GFC in 2008 that um, uh, knocked everything on the head. But at least there was some a whole lot of uh, eating places a little bit further down the street, uh, yeah, down so by, the, uh, by the casino. Yeah. yeah. There was always a lot around there. But how was that experience? Did did you enjoy the experience of being a fan guest of honor? Uh, yes, um, it, it was. Uh, I I didn't particularly enjoy that people couldn't come and visit, mm. 
And the the other thing that sort of affected me at the time is Alicia's health had deteriorated. So she was in a, a wheelchair. Uh, and uh, we had a powered wheelchair. And um, she roared around in it rather like I did in Glasgow. Yes. <laughs> um, for the same sort of reasons. And um, she got lost in an interesting way at one point. Um, she'd been wandering around outside the convention area. And uh, at one stage, uh, asked for directions to the Hilton, not realising there were two Hiltons. And the person she asked didn't know about the new one and directed her to the old one entirely in the wrong direction and miles away. Mm. And she had to be rescued from there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, look, being a looker after is it, uh, you know, it, it, it's um, you have to build it into your your schedule. Uh, just just as one thing for being the uh, guest of honor was, um, I had made no arrangement to. Uh, um, record my I, I must have been down for giving a speech because it wasn't so much an interview it was me giving a speech and I'm never very good at this I may take notes but I either lose them just before or put them in the wrong order or uh, anyway I have no recollection of what I talked about and I would love to know uh, and I, if anyone knows of anywhere it's recorded or uh, uh, yeah, we had a lot of problems with the recording. They were going to charge us some ungodly amount of money for the recording, and we just couldn't afford it. And uh, so that was a bit of a problem. And uh, that came in late, and we just weren't able to get over it, unfortunately. I don't think that anything was recorded at that convention. I, I may be wrong, but I think I don't think anything was. I'm not sure about 1975, but I do well, remember getting in 70... touch. No, oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm flipping back to 1975. Yeah, that's all right. That's okay. Uh, because my the only contact in my life with the Governor General was, in fact, with his wife at that time. Mm. This is 1975. This is when Whitlam uh, was running the the country, was the Prime Minister. And the Governor General's wife was a professional translator at conventions. And someone suggested I contact her and get a quote for uh, in case anyone needed translation. And the result was so astronomical that I've never considered it since for anything. Mm. But uh, yeah, there are, there all... video, uh, there, yeah. Are, there are video records. Yes. But the, the, this was an old standard of video that's pretty low quality. Um, if anyone has seen the uh, the grainy black and white videos, for example, of Ursula's Kiss of Honor speech, um, you know what I mean. Uh, the other thing was the light uh, that uh, refers back to that was the lighting that you needed, the intensity of lighting on the speaker meant that the speaker couldn't see anyone in the audience. Um, videos are a lot easier now so we're through to 2010 when you were fan guest of honor yeah. uh what's um what's happened to uh what's happened to robin johnson since then he's still traveling well i uh let me see in 2010 i was still traveling uh my wife enjoyed going on cruises i was unsure of the state of my stomach when the water wasn't flat so the first few we did were river cruises. Mm. And we were, we've done several in Russia, in the Ukraine, and in Europe. But um, we did one or two um, ocean ones. And we did one cruise in 20, 2010, I think it was, that we, we joined the cruise in South Africa went via St. Helena to South America, up the coast of, of Brazil, 
stopping at lots of places. We stopped at Devil's Island. We stopped at uh, other places in the Caribbean, wound up at Fort Lauderdale, and then stayed in Orlando for a week. Okay. I remember going up to visit uh, the Haldemans who were living in Florida by then, as well as the Simsies who had moved there. But we then uh, flew to Ecuador and took a cruise around the Galapagos Islands. And uh, then on to South America. And um, that was a marvelous trip. And shortly after, uh, given that Alicia was needed a wheelchair by this time, I have a picture somewhere of her being loaded on a rubber ducky in the Galapagos from the boat to go and visit some island. And the uh, the difficulty for her was wheelchairs are not appropriate on sand mm. or very rocky islands, and the Galapagos are either one or the other or both. So she didn't get to see the giant turtles close up. She didn't get to shoo the blue-legged, blue whatever they were, or the... Pink and yellow. Or like boobies or whatever they're called, yeah. Well, they're so non-people shy. Mm. And, you know, you had to brush them out of the way. So, um, so you've, done a, you've done a lot of traveling. You had a marvellous trip yep. without some of the advantages of being pedestrian. But she, she got quite a lot earlier after that. And uh, she died in uh, 2013. And... Uh, my situation was that um, she left me the use of, during my lifetime of the house, which was basically her family's house. And while she didn't have any siblings, she had cousins by the dozens, mm -hmm. all younger. She she was the martyr, for, well, not martyr, but cousin familias. And frankly, it got a little awkward. So I did a deal with the family and they bought me out. And uh, I'm living on the proceeds of that now. So you moved to Ballarat where you're staying now? When, well, when was that? I had been visiting Lee and Valma in Ballarat quite often. And they had moved into a uh, retirement village where Valma's mother also lived or had lived. Mm -hmm. And um, I quite liked the place. And it was a lot cheaper than anything the equivalent in Tasmania. So I moved over here. So I've um, become a very occasional visitor to Tasmania these days. Um, and uh, I'm now a Ballarat resident. But uh, you're still getting to World Cons? I, I saw you in I'm Finland still, and I well, saw, you, saw you in Glasgow. The, the, re the recent trip was my first overseas trip since before COVID. Mm-hmm. And uh, almost the first trip out of Ballarat. I only been to Melbourne a couple of times for medical reasons. I've only been uh, out of Victoria once for a convention in Canberra um, since COVID. Mm -hmm. Of course, Victoria had very very tight lockdown rules, as you know. Very strict, yes. So you were you were at Glasgow. Um, is that going well, to be your last? Trip, well, the, my last trip Glasgow was the major reason for timing. But I visited uh, those of my remaining relatives in France, Germany, Denmark, and England. Oh, and Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I got around quite a bit. Do you but see yourself going more. to any more world cons in the future? Well, I would have to say Seattle is a sort of if. Mm -hmm. It depends on uh, November the 6th or November the whatever. Whatever it is, it depends yeah. depends on January the 6th as well. Yeah. But uh, you would certainly like to go if you can. I would like to go if I'm up to it. Um, my doctor told me off for taking as long as I did on this last trip. And I must say, I did arrive back exhausted. But I blame that on the time difference, not uh, <laughs> physical strain. 
But 24 hours on a plane is, is a lot, as you know. It is. It is a long time. So, look, I think we've pretty much covered your Finnish career all the way right through. Is uh, Do you think if there's anything that you can um, uh, think of that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention, like to talk about? Well, the, the sad thing is for everyone of my age is all of my friends are dropping off the dropping off the twig to use the phrase. Mm. Um, it's nice to see so many uh, uh, still extant, <laughs> but um, uh, one one of my great friends I stayed with in Bristol last um, it's still last month. Um, has already died. Uh -huh. Not not a fan, but a very well known person in Britain, um, Chris Searle. Um, and uh, oh, don't end on a maudlin note. It's no, let's this. not. Let's not. Well, look, um, I think we're about done. Uh, thank you very much, Robin, for this discussion. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we're going to call for questions in a minute, but I think that um, Edie was going to show a few photos that uh, Lee oh, had yeah. got together. We showed uh, one during the talk, uh, but we sort of jumped around all over the place. But we go, oh, here we go. Here's uh, here's Robin uh, uh, having um, having a picnic somewhere or other. Do you remember when that was? I think that might have been... Uh... There was a convention in Adelaide in the hills. No, that's in 71. We went for a picnic soon after you moved here. Oh, okay. So there you go. So there's, I'm glad yeah. Lee's with us because I wasn't in fandom at that stage. So um, I was... Uh, and as you can 15. see, it, uh, it's post it's post toupee area for me. Oh, okay. All so, right. And I lost the toupee in, I think, 72. All right. Next. Not the wrong word, yes. There he is. That's um, still 72. That's an invention up in the hills again. I think that, that would be invention, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, with the late uh, uh, Christine, Christine Ashby. Who, yes, Christine uh, McGowan, yeah. as she was. She may well have been Christine McGowan still at that point, but uh, she Probably married um, Derek Ashby. Interesting, the magazine she's reading. For the articles. Just reading it for oh, the articles. Oh, the articles, yes. Yes. So who have we got here? You're right. So it's, yeah. So it's Robin on the Robin on the left, Bill right in the middle, and John Foister standing up, handing over, um, handing over something to Bill, or the yeah. other way. No, I'm sure it was him handing things over to Bill because it was always that way. He was always doing that. Yes. <laughs> Bill was chairman of the business session at Aussiecon, uh, and the reason why I didn't need to attend, I think. So where's that? Which one? That's oh, uh, this, QCon? This, I, yes, this would have been one of the rather few conventions in Brisbane. And I think the person standing up is um uh let's see. From the let's have a quick squint. Um from the left, Shane McCormick, Robin Johnson, uh um, I think that might be John Ryan. No, no, Dennis Stocks. Sorry, John Ryan, Dennis Stocks, and Frank Brining standing up. Frank Brining, the author Frank standing Brining up. Frank Brining was a Queensland author. Uh, Dennis Stocks was a Queensland fan who had a fanzine called uh, Battle Rash, I seem to remember. Well, that's because he was a skydiver as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought um, <laughs> the gravel rash from a skydive would be somewhat um, more concerning. Yes, I would have thought so. Oh, now I think this is mislabeled because I think the woman with the hair uh, hair thing is uh, Elaine Pells. Could be, actually. Uh, and the uh, gentleman with his back to us is, I think, Filthy Pierre. Oh, okay. Is is that an exactly Aussie Con? That is, the, that is the Aussie Con membership badge, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. And uh, Bruce Gillespie at the back. Uh, not sure about Filthy Pierre, uh, but uh, I don't remember whether he attended or not. But uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I think uh, that must be at the at the banquet for Ozicon. Mm. 
Yep. I'm. I just realised I'm wearing a, a yellowish sort of orangey badge, and the other two are wearing white ones, which means they weren't on the committee. I think they were. Um, they were from Philadelphia. What was the name? Um, ah. Doesn't matter. It'll come to you at some stage. All I uh, remember is he I had a basement full of piano organs. Say again. Don and Grace Lundry. That's right, yes. Amazing Grace. Uh, now there, that must be, uh, you can see behind me and Ursula is the screen that we had up so that the slide projection could show beforehand. And uh, you can also see that the lights are quite bright. That is, of course, fuzzy con. Mm. Oh, right. Here we are, post Ozicon. In the yellow, that. Jerry Hanfield. Oh, no, yes. Hand. This is the uh, soccer match that, uh, the football match that Foyster, uh, John, and Elizabeth had at, at their farm up at Kyneton. So there's Robin. Kerry Hanfield, Lee Harding. I don't know who the person is behind Lee. And then there's me and Paul Stevens. So we had a get together after Aussie Con to sort of, I don't know, celebrate yes. that we survived. Not sufficient clues of the person behind Lee. No, Peter Miller comes to mind, but I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. right. Any more, Edie? Which one's that? Uh, yes, this is this was done in Tasmania. Oh, yes, right, yeah. Relatively um, recently. Yeah, Keith Curtis. Keith Curtis with the bowler hat. Um Carrie uh Carrie Lenahan at the end. I guess that's me in the blue. And that's and Mike O'Brien. Yep. <laughs> is that's more recent? That was taken in Glasgow of, uh, Rose Mitchell and talking to you, Robin, at um, Rose uh, in, co guest of a uh, co co chair at um, uh, 2010. Yes, 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 she ran it. I just basically hung around the edges, she just didn't want to Ro do any Rose speaking to anybody. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I don't know how good she is at delegating as well, but she's uh, as well, far as she, I'm concerned, being she, chairman, she, she, you delegate. Well, you try to, but uh, some of the times you just have to take the work on yourself. But anyway, um, Edie, I think we're done here for this. And then, uh, if we have any questions, um, guy, do I you want? Screen. Do you want to? Um, do you want to read the questions out, Edie? Sure, uh, Rich. <laughs> excuse me, Rich. Are you still there? Do you have? Uh, you want to ask your question? Hi, Robin. Yeah, hello. Hello. That that really pleasant dinner we had together at. Uh, Dublin in 2019. Right. Um, I haven't got your picture on my screen. Yeah. Give me a minute. Well, that's okay. Here we go. There he is. Ah, there he is. There you are. I guess I was curious about the first Aussie Con 75. Don Tuck was a guest, but he never was at the convention, was he? Yes. Uh, Mike O'Brien knew Don Tuck and lived quite near him. Don had... Uh, Worked in Melbourne during the war. He was uh, some sort of researcher. Uh, but he moved back to Tasmania and he was very difficult to move. I have never met him. I've spoken to him on the phone enough. But uh, various people um, uh, who, who were at Ozicon went down to Tasmania to meet him. Uh, I remember Forry asking me if he needed a passport. Uh, <laughs> um, Tasmania is, of course, a state of Australia, so needless to say, you don't. Oh, you should have told him that he did. Come on. <laughs> we, have, we have to leave all of our uh, foreign tourists astray. That's part of the fun. Yeah. Ori and Don would have been taught writing to each other since the late 30s. Mm. Yeah. 
But that would have been, I'm sure, the only time they met. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to remember who else went down to Tasmania. Uh, uh, I know Jack um, from Baltimore did. Uh, Jack Chalker. Um, but, um, yeah, th that was one of the disappointments. Um, well, was it called one? I don't remember it as a crisis because it became clear to us as the excuses kept mounting, you know, oh, my daughter's ill, I can't leave her, you know. Uh, I found out afterwards she wasn't really. It was, you know, something worse than a stub toe, but not bad enough to not leave Tasmania for a week. I think um, he uh, just found the whole concept of was, attending a very large convention completely overwhelming and just well, couldn't face it. Of course, talking about large convention, it was large by Australian standards mm. at the time. But uh, I mean, my, uh, even Nikon uh, would probably not have topped a thousand. I haven't looked up the figures recently, but uh, uh, we had something around the six hundred mark in Adazicon. Six six fifty somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, Actually, well, we, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to call for more questions. Please, Robin. Oh, I was just going to say, I think there were more than 600 or 650 warm bodies because we gave day memberships to to uh, people who had exhibited in the previous uh, art exhibition at the town hall and whose pictures were went on, were sort of promoted to the main art show. But the main art show had a lot of good stuff by... Mm. Well known people. I mean, um, I think Jim Burns won the uh, the Best of Show award, uh, and he's still winning still Best back. of Show. Mm. Uh, first of all, greetings from us down here in uh, Florida. You've been a guest in this Glad house. Glad you survived various hurricanes. Oh my God! Yeah, the uh, hurricanes were terrible, but not here. They skipped us almost altogether. All I got is a few branches down. But uh, You're so close anyway, to the water level. the master of this house, Joe Green, greets you. And, of course, Rosie does. And uh, I recall uh, our numerous dinners together, especially the one in uh, Ronette's Island, where I got so <laughs> surprised by the creature at my feet and uh, the quokka. Uh, and uh, be accurate underneath your chair, you yes, had it was. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. But the uh, anyway, I wanted to point out something. We first met in 1974 at uh, the Atlanta Deep South Con you attended. Actually, no, it was earlier. I did earlier? go to Atlanta. I, I went to a Deep South Con, uh, uh. I'm not sure it was, I must have been 73. 73 was in New Orleans. 72. 72. Uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. I was the only one that was. Yeah, okay. Was my, my remembrance of you is you were asleep lying on a table. <laughs> That's <laughs> probably accurate. But anyway, nevertheless, more than 50 years, and thanks for them. I wanted to tell you how, how grateful we've been to know you, man. It's been just terrific. Seeing you. you visited Your here. Your shelves behind you are not full enough. <laughs> no, they are not. Unlike Perry's, who uh, look pretty full. Oh, yeah, I've got, I got, got the whole room, the whole, the whole wall. That's also the paper, got bookshelves the size for paperbacks, which is yep. important <laughs> Those books are put the Hugo winners back here and so forth. But yeah. anyway, yes. Take care, man. We're glad to see you again. We we'll hope to see you again in Seattle. Well, I, I hope to make it. I hope you get the right person in November. Oh, well, I'll try our best. <laughs> I'm kind of ill now, but I will Sorry, see you later. I would have said it was not a good uh, place to be for that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I think that is the last of our questions. Uh, Robin, thank you very much. Perry and Lee, thank you very much, uh, especially Perry for orchestrating everything. Uh, and um, thanks for coming. Well, thank thanks you. very much for having us.